All right, guys, welcome back to the shop. So we left off with some pretty good progress yesterday. We've got most of the footboard cleaned up except for the two divider pieces. Now we are going to the long stretchers on the headboard. So each day I've tried to lay out, you know, what progress I want to get done in the day. And so far every day I've uh, come short of what I wanted to get done. So I don't actually honestly know what I'm going to, be able to get through today, but I'm hoping that by the end of the day, we have all the parts for the headboard and the footboard all cleaned up and ready for finish or a glue up, whichever one. I still haven't decided on what I want to do there. Because then once we're done that, then we can start working on the side rails and getting them all prepped too. But I mostly just want to get the headboard or footboard ready for a glue up just because I'm very quickly running out of time on this project and I would like to get it done sooner rather than later. So in yesterday's video, I forgot to mention that I am using the plunge base on my router. In the past, I've talked a lot about how you always want to use a fixed base on a router when anytime you're adding an edge profile, just because it's a little bit more accurate. When you're using a plunge base like this, there is some chance that you're going to get a different edge profile each time you plunge down. So with this three quarter bit, obviously it's big enough that it's not really going to be that noticeable whether or not there's an issue and we're also doing a decent amount of sanding to it afterwards but if you're doing something like a chamfer or a smaller roundover, it can become very obvious if you're not plunging deep enough on certain passes or certain areas of the project so typically speaking for edge profiles I prefer a fixed base but in this case with this large roundover bit I found that it's way easier to just have it in the plunge base because then I can make one pass at a shallower depth you know we're not using the full cutting edge of the bit then we can plunge to full depth and make that final cut. And so when we're plunging in on that first cut there, we're only about an eighth of an inch shy of the final cut. Because if you consider a roundover bit, the majority of the cutting action is only gonna happen when the bit is at its full plunge depth or its, you know, its full cutting depth, when you're cutting that full three quarter roundover. Anything below that is not really gonna be any kind of an issue because you're not really putting a lot of strain on the bit. It's only when you're making that full depth cut that you're gonna have a lot of stress on the bit. Okay, one final update on the Cubitron 2. I know you guys are probably sick of me talking about it, uh, but so far with this brand new hard pad on here, we are holding on just fine. I haven't had the disc come flying off yet. I did the whole the sanding on all of our stretchers so far with this, uh, and I haven't had any issues just yet. So I don't think it's gonna last. I don't think it's gonna be a permanent fix. There's probably, you know, there's definitely a better solution out there. Uh, but so far, new this new pad is working. So now we're gonna move on to adding in our edge profiles. We're gonna add the 1 8 round over to the inside edge and then the 3 quarter round over to the outside edge. Then we'll finish it off with a little bit of 180 grit hand sanding across the whole surface here. And we should be left with two really nice looking stretchers.
Okay, so now we're gonna work on our divider pieces and I'm gonna be using the drum sander for this. Now, again, I wanna make sure that woodworking is as approachable as possible. Uh, so the only reason I am using the drum sander here, uh, for one, is because these boards have a lot of figure to them. So the drum sander is just gonna be a little bit easier than using the hand plane. But that doesn't mean that you cannot use a hand plane to do this exact same procedure. You can use a hand plane on all these pieces, no issue. You just have to go back through and use a random orbital sander to clean up any possible tear out from that hand plane. So the only reason I'm using this machine is for one, I already own it, so I'm not, I'm not telling you you have to go to buy it. Two, I paid a lot of money for this, so I should probably use it every now and then. And three, it is going to do a better job than me hand planing, and it should be faster on these four smaller pieces than trying to go through and hand plane them down and you know, constantly check them down. Okay, so we have all the divider pieces all fit up beautifully. They're all sitting really nicely in between those long stretchers. We got that nice offset going in between them. It looks really good. So all that's left to do for the finishing work is to get those panels sanded up. And there's the side rails, but we're gonna deal with those later on because I wanna get these panels done. Because what I'm thinking is I only have to sand one grit on those panels. They're already sanded up to 150 grit through the drum sander. I just wanna go through and sand them with some 180 grit uh, to just do a fin nice finish sanding on them. Because then once those are done, we can actually move on to our glue up. And we have to do, we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be adding in some dowels uh, to the tenons on the long stretchers before we do the glue up. But I want to hopefully get this glued up today because that would be, that would just be awesome. If I can get this glued up today, that means tomorrow when I come to the shop, I can either work on the side rails and get those done, or I can do the, the last bits of finishing work and apply the first coats of finish to the headboard and footboard, which means we are very, very close to being done. Again, like I said, I wanna be done this project by Friday because we have to get started on that other bed that I then have to get to a client in three weeks after that. So the next thing that we need to do before we can do the glue up is add in the dowel pin. So my initial plan is I wanted to glue everything up and then go back in, drill my holes and install the dowels. Because I'm not really going for a drawboard dowel in this in this case, uh, just because I don't think that that's particularly necessary. Because most times when I've tried to do drawboard dowels in the past, something has gone wrong. And in this project, I, I don't want to risk it. So all I'm going for is just a tight fitting dowel and I just want a nice straight hole. And so I did a quick test fit up just to see how everything is coming together, see how to make sure everything's fitting up before we you know, start jumping in to get the process of the glue up happening. Uh, and I noticed that we can't actually fully clamp this thing together with these pipe clamps that I have. I, I'm sure if I made a couple more of these long ones, because I can make two more of them, uh, we might be able to get them going underneath and that would help because right now the amount of pressure that we're pulling on this, it's actually bowing a little bit, but we still don't have enough to close the joint on either side. The joints on this side, right by where the crank is, they're nicely tightened up. They're exactly where they're supposed to be and where, where I fitted them up before. 
The ones on this side though, there's still a very small gap in there. So there's just not enough power. And I think it's a big case of the, of the pipe clamps are causing it to bow and curve. So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna start by getting the dowel holes drilled for these divider pieces in the middle. So we're gonna leave these nicely clamped up. We're gonna drill through right into the workbench. You know, it's, I have a sacrificial workbench top. I don't really care that much about it. We'll have those holes that are perfectly fitted and in the proper spot for when these pieces are fully closed up. Because again, I've got these clamps on here pulling everything as tight together as it can possibly go. So when we put that dowel in, it'll basically do the same thing as draw boring, where it'll lock these pieces in the tightest spot they can possibly be in. Then once we have our middle ones done up, then we're gonna disassemble all this craziness so that I'm not having to flip things around as much. Then we'll just focus on doing one corner at a time. So we'll use both clamps, um, both on the end and on the edge here, to help pull everything together, make sure it's as squared up as it possibly can be, only referencing the one edge here, and then we'll drill our single hole here, we'll move our clamps to the next corner, drill our hole there, move our clamps around so that we got the threads on this side, drill those holes, and then we should be good to go. And so our dowels are actually very important to add in, even if we didn't need them for the glue up, which they're just gonna be super helpful during the glue up, this kind of construction, it's pretty necessary to do something with these mortise and tenon joints to make sure that they can't come apart. Because just the way that this bed is built, these joints, there's a good chance that they will be in tension. So they can easily be pulled out, and over time, if that glue fails inside the mortise, those, those tenons are gonna eventually fall out. So just by putting that dowel through there, it'll lock that tenon in place so that it physically cannot come out. Very similar to what a dovetail does, just by its geometry, it makes it so that you can't pull that frame apart. So that's the whole point of these dowels in this case, is just to make sure that the headboard and footboard can't be pulled to the side and be pulled apart. We wanna avoid that as much as possible, and that's the whole point of these dowels. Okay, so for this glue up, uh, we're gonna do the footboard first because I got all the holes drilled and I can get this thing together, I can get it sitting. Uh, then we can start working on the headboard and start drilling all the holes in it. Uh, so I just kinda wanna deal with one at a time. But for the glue up, we're gonna be using a uh, hide glue. Now hide glue is something I only know about because I tried to get into chair making. I still plan to do more of that. Uh, but as you guys can see, I'm kind of busy with uh, other projects right now. Now the benefit of hide glue is that it's reversible. So unlike normal glue, if you apply steam to hide glue or joints that are connected with hide glue, it will slowly dissolve the glue and then you can disassemble that joint. Now obviously that's gonna mess up the joint, but in the case of having to do a repair, there's nothing better than using hide glue. So on a project like this, you could very easily use type on three and there really wouldn't be an issue of it. The only reason I wanna use hide glue here is because I like it because it's a little bit more on the traditional side. And again, with the traditional joinery, it's a cool additive if I can tell my customers that, hey, if anything breaks, give me a call, we can fix it. It's definitely an advantage to being able to fix things and having that repairability to it. So although this isn't as strong as type on three, the glue doesn't really matter. And you know, especially in this case, the glue is not really meant to be doing anything uh, because that's what all of our joinery is for.
so as far as a large glue up goes, that was pretty easy. Uh, the high glue is, I'm still learning how to use it. It's kind of a nightmare glue because it's, it's, it's so runny compared to like type on three, which is a pretty viscous. So on the bottom of the leg here, we're just gonna epoxy on a little bit of leather. Now I've decided I wanna start doing this on a lot of my furniture because there's nothing worse than buying or building a really nice piece of furniture and then having to stick those stupid felt pads on the bottom so that, that furniture doesn't damage your floor. Because those felt pads, they always fall off. They always pick up a ton of dog hair or cat hair in your house. Uh, and they just generally ruin the look of the piece. I think they look really gross. So we're using some 5 minute epoxy and this nice brown veg tan leather. This is a pre-dyed roll that I bought a while back for some project. I don't quite remember which one. Uh, but yeah, we're just going to, we're going to epoxy this on. We're just going to use tape to clamp it over the edges there and everything should come out just perfectly. Alright guys, so that is the headboard and footboard fully glued up. We are actually going to get this project done this week. I'm super excited. I did not think when I got up this morning that I was going to get to the point where I'd have both the headboard and the footboard glued up. If you're wondering how the, the headboard is standing up nice and vertical on the bench here, I have it pinned between a couple of bench dogs in the front, and then I've got my little Veritas uh, bench dog clamp thinger on the back just locked in, and it actually creates a very solid platform to keep this thing in a nice vertical orientation. So if you don't have dog holes on your workbench, I highly recommend looking into it. It's probably the single most useful thing that I ever did with my workbench. The one beautiful thing about the way that we did this high glue, and this is one of the biggest tips that I could ever give anyone about doing a glue up with mortise and tenon joinery, is always put the glue in the mortise, never put it on the tenon. Because what happens is when you put it on the tenon, as it's pressing into that mortise, it squeezes out to the sides, then you get it all over the place around here. Very hard to clean up, very annoying, especially with the step design that we have here, super annoying to clean up all that squeeze out. Whereas when you put it in the mortise, what happens is that the, as the tenon pushes in, it pushes the glue to the bottom of the mortise where we left that little bit of extra space, all for that extra glue to build up. Then you get absolutely, we don't have a bit of squeeze out except around our dowels, obviously, because there's no way to prevent squeeze out there. Uh, but on our actual joints, on, you know, on all these mortise and tenon joints, there is not a one bit of squeeze out anywhere, which is perfect. That's exactly what you want to see because it means now we don't have to go through and clean all that up. So again, when you're doing a glue up with mortise and tenon joinery, put the glue into the mortise, never on the tenon. Just keep that in mind, it'll save you a ton of time. Anyway guys, as you can tell by my voice, I am super excited with everything we were able to get done today. This is, again, way farther ahead than I thought I was gonna be by the end of today. The bed is looking amazing. Uh, I'm super, just, I am so happy with the point that we're at now. And I'm really glad that everything is looking good. You know, that was my biggest fear as I started kind of getting things together is that, you know, this might not look good once we start adding in all the different components in that. 
but it just it looks amazing and it's still in a very rough form we still have a lot of finishing work to do to it to make sure that this thing is the best it's ever gonna look so i'm really excited to get in more into this but as always guys i do hope you enjoyed this video and i will see you in the next one mm -hmm.